Welcome, everybody. Hope you're doing well on this, what day of the week is it? Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday night. Uh, thanks for joining. We are going to talk about casks, cask programs, Irish whiskey cask programs tonight. So I'm delighted that uh, you're interested in Irish whiskey cask programs. So uh, looking forward to chatting about those. So before we get started, I'm going to pour a drop of whiskey. We'll drop a single cask, red breast, sunny Malloy's. So let me know if you're drinking something as well. If you've got a drop of whiskey in your glass, let me know what it is. And we'll chat along about it. Got a drop of uh, Sunny Malloy's here. Lovely single cask, seeing as we're talking about single casks. Uh, all sherry single cask here. Tonight we're talking about Irish whiskey casks, so we'll have a bit of crack. If there's something in your glass, do let me know. Who this, who this, JJ Quigley in the house, welcome. And if you're joining on YouTube or Twitter or Facebook, you're very welcome. And if you're watching this on the replay, you're also very welcome. We're going to be uh, talking about Irish Whiskey Cask programs. Uh, they're uh, yeah, giving an overview and an independent introduction to Irish Whiskey Cask programs. Stacy's drinking Tyr Connell, 16-year-old. Jim has a drop of Roe and Co. Good man. Michael Kloss, red breast cask strength. Same as our fearless leader. Good man, Michael. Uh, Scott's got red breast 15. I knew you'd come with whiskey. Like I knew you wouldn't come to a talk about whiskey cask programs without whiskey in your glasses. Like you never let me down. Dar Gaelic, good man, Jordan, the big guns. Patrick Miller up in Colorado. Good man, Patrick. Talnu and New Make, just cask today. Good man, Patrick. Mark Ashley drinking Sexton. John is mowing the lawn. John, you have to have your priorities right. What's more important now, mowing the lawn or learning about whiskey casks? Like Tony Nicoletti with the story. Good man, Tony. And Steve, our fearless administrator, joining us from Colorado Springs. Going to start with a bit of Talnua Continuum Cask, which he gave me a drop of, sent me a drop of during the week as well. I'm looking forward to trying. Um, Rich Pastor next got Tyr Connell, 16 year old. Good stuff. You've all got your whiskies. Uh, so, Slauncha to all of you. Thanks for joining. Got my uh, red breast, Sonny Malloy's, 16 year old, isn't it? Which is 17 year old. I forget. I think it's 16 year old. Single cask. All right. Do, 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 do. Mark Stevenson, Bushmill 16, Ed Stannard, Conakilty Single Grain, and Power Signature. No fear of you. No fear of you. Dave, uh, Sailor's Home, The Journey. Good man. Dave, just back from San Diego. We had a few drinks the other night. Very enjoyable night in San Diego. It's great to see him. Tommy Smith, Diagwit to yourself as well. And Dahi joining us from Spain. Never misses a, never misses a chance for an old drop of whiskey. Good man, and joining us for the crack. Redbreast 21, another big gun in the glass. Bubbly water for Scott. Okay, well, you've got loads of great things in your glasses. Fair play to you. Uh, whether you're joining from Ireland, from uh, the United States, anywhere in the world, Spain, there, like like Dahi, uh, you're very welcome. We're going to talk about cask programs, Irish whiskey cask programs this evening. And uh, over the next 9, 10, maybe 11 hours, we're going to explore every single cask program. No, we're not. We're not going to explore every cask program. We're not going to be here for 9 or 10 hours. I have dinner to go to as well. But we're going to talk, I want to introduce people to uh, what an Irish Whiskey Cask program is. I want to introduce you all to it. Some of you will be very familiar. Uh, and I think that tonight uh, there are people here who have, uh, who are newly interested in Irish Whiskey Cask programs. This was, uh, this event came about as a result of questions that we kept getting in our Facebook community, our Irish Whiskey Fans of America Facebook community about Irish Whiskey Cask programs. And what's a good one? What's a bad one? What to consider? How do you get your whiskey to America? Lots of great questions, and I thought the easiest way to answer all of those would be to put together kind of an overview, an independent uh, presentation of how it works, what kind of things are available, what to consider, and then I'll share with you how to get your, your whiskey to America if that's what you're interested in as well. So you may find that uh, a lot of, if you're, if you're, if you're uh, experience in the world of cask programs. If you have a cask, if you've invested in a cask, if you've bought a cask, if you've been uh, watching from the sidelines for a few years, you might be very familiar. But I think there'll be something here for everybody, whether you're new to the, the world of Irish whiskey cask programs or it's something you're very experienced in. All right, so you all have whiskey in your glass. Good stuff. John O'Donovan there is joining us from Cork with Liberator Storehouse Special Batch. Mr. Irish Malts in the house. Good man. We'll talk about John and Irish Malts later as well. Great stuff. Lots of big guns in, in the bottles tonight, or in the glasses tonight. All right, so let me get my screen ready here. 
and we'll crack into this. Thanks everyone for joining. And look, uh, if you have any questions throughout the night, just put them in the comments. I'll get to every question. I'll try and answer them. If I don't know the answer, I'll make up the answer. No, I won't. I'll, I'll go and find the answer and I'll get her for you. Uh, this is uh, a journey for all of us who are at various stages of the journey of exploring CASC programs. So let me share my screen with you. Do, 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 and we'll get this going. All right. Do, do, do. Here we go. It worked. Technology worked. Amazing. Okay, so let me right size this now so we can move steadily through it. Lovely job. There we go. All right, so uh, you're all very welcome. If you're just joining us, uh, we're going to talk about uh, Irish whiskey cask programs. Um, I think you'll all agree that the Irish whiskey landscape has never been more diverse, more interesting. There's never been more opportunity to get involved. There have never been more distilleries. There have never been more Irish whiskey brands. If you're joining from Ireland, you might be surprised just how many whiskey brands make it to the US that have never even been released in Ireland, uh, bottled independently and find their ways, ways to shelves. Those of you in the US um, have been watching with interest the developments in Ireland and seeing what things are released exclusively for Ireland. It's an amazing time uh, for Irish whiskey. Uh, and I think it's never been a better time to be exploring the, the types of conversations we're gonna have tonight about cask programs. So today on the island of Ireland, we're really fortunate that there are 39 or 40, depends on who you speak to, uh, operating distilleries on the island of Ireland. Uh, when I was growing up in Ireland in the 1980s, there was, uh, at one point, there was only two distilleries, Middleton and Bushmills, on the entire island, uh, which was a, a sad time. And those two distilleries flew the flag for many, many years. Uh, two, and as recently as 2011, there were only five distilleries on the island of Ireland. Today now, 39. In the, in the last 10, what's that, 10 years, we've gone from five distilleries to 39. An incredible, incredible leap. Uh, so it's a really exciting time, and it can be hard to keep up with all of the distilleries. And I think uh, even when I was researching this to, uh, over the last couple of weeks, I found myself going back and saying, wait, what's that distillery? I don't even know anything about them. And having to explore them, you know, there's distilleries out there that are making whiskey that have yet to talk about what they're doing. And so that's exciting. That's interesting. And I think it's good news and long, long may it continue. Um, so 39 operating distilleries on the island of Ireland. Um, Irish whiskey itself, in order to sustain those, has to keep growing, doesn't it? And it, it for, for, for many years, there wasn't the distribution channels, there wasn't the interest in Irish whiskey, but Irish whiskey sales are now growing at a massive, massive rate, which is fantastic for us to see. So over the last 10 years, according to the Irish Whiskey Association, global sales of Irish whiskey have gone from 60 million bottles in 2010 to 144 million bottles in January 2020. That's incredible growth. It's rare to see more than double, more than uh, doubling a category uh, in the space of a decade. Now, the the uh, it would be remiss of us not to mention that uh, most of that is driven by Jameson. The growth of Jameson has laid the groundwork for the Irish whiskey category and has allowed others now to stand on the shoulders of the giant that is the green giant that is Jameson and uh, follow in the footsteps, but also explore the distribution channels and the markets that have been opened up around the world because of the success of Jameson. So that's a good, it's a good news story all around. I think you'd agree. Um, in terms of options available to you now, if you're interested in cast programs, well, there's never been more options. There have never been uh, more ways to get involved. Um, you know, you can get involved in a in a cooperative of Irish whiskey cask purchases. You can um, get involved with distilleries who are using nanotechnology. You can uh, get involved with distilleries that have master distillers that have 25, 30 years experience. Uh, Hall of Fame master distillers can distill your cask of whiskey. Uh, you can have your whiskey peated, non-peated, single malt, single pot still, single grain. The options now are uh, incredible and have never been as varied as they are today. So that not only brings excitement and choice, it also brings confusion and uh, scratching of the heads wondering, okay, but with all these programs and all these options and all these variables and all the choices, how do I then as an individual or maybe as part of a group choose which one to participate in or, or which one to, um, yeah, which one to, to, to put my money into? And any cask investment as a purchase is no small investment, is it? It's going to be a significant investment. This is money that can go to many other things. And so you want to make sure you're choosing the right one. But the good news is there's lots out there. We're going to look at some, some of the options, but we're going to talk most importantly about 
uh, more kind of um, top level what to consider kind of from a macro standpoint, what to examine and understand and evaluate as part of your your cask um, your cask investment cask purchase journey. Um, let me see. Here are some of the, in fact, this is most of the cask distillery programs that are available today. So of the 39 distilleries, uh, I was able to uh, discover, find, explore, uh, understand 16 different cask programs from distilleries. Now, there are distilleries that have operated cask programs in the past that aren't operating programs today. There may be some on this list that have listed the distillery cask program on their website and may have closed off the option to purchase from them. Um, we looked at all of these distilleries, try and understand what they're offering, but as best as we can uh, understand, all of these are offering cask programs in some form. Now, if you take the likes of Killown, Ireland's smallest distillery, uh, you may have to get uh, very close and very familiar uh, with, uh, with Brendan Carty and twist his arm to sell you a cask because he doesn't have very many of them. Uh, so that could be a little bit more difficult than the likes of, let's say, a larger distillery like a West Cork Distillers, who themselves have some variables around their cask programs. We'll talk about some of these as we go through. So 16 out of 39 distilleries have programs. There are uh, many of the distilleries do not operate uh, cask programs at all. At least they don't talk about them. They don't publish them. Maybe there are some behind the scenes uh, handshakes that could take place if you're personally connected, but these are the retail cask programs that are published anyway. Um, let me see. There are also non-distillery cask programs. So see Nick Ryan there in the audience. Welcome, Nick. The, um, there are non-distillery cask programs. I'm just sharing two examples here. There are many more non-distillery examples, uh, and I'll reference them in a second, but Thoman Gate Whiskey is an example. Nick Ryan here in the audience, we, he's been on the lock-in. He's been on the podcast. You're familiar with Nick and his great uh, endeavors to bring whiskey distilling back to Limerick. That's an example of a non-distillery cask program in the sense of it's not that there isn't a distillery involved. It's that the distillery isn't selling directly. Nick is instead building out the program around his brand. And there's also middlemen, uh, middle merchants, uh, not just men, who operate between retailers and uh, between individuals and between the distilleries. And I'm showcasing here uh, as an example, uh, Celtic Whiskey Shop, uh, a, a, a shop that many of you are familiar with, uh, has is probably around the longest. It's the most awarded uh, whiskey shop in Ireland. It uh, was around long before there was a, such an interest in Irish whiskey. And Celtic Whiskey Shop are um, of high repute and um, very trustworthy in terms of what they're offering. And so we'll talk about them a little bit later as well. There are other things I maybe have missed in terms of there are cask shares, there are cask, um, yeah, you can get a share of a cask, you can buy a bottling from a cask every year. Boan Distillery will do something along those lines. W.D. O'Connell will do something along those lines. Uh, Black's uh, Distillery and Cork will do something along those lines. There are other variables out there we can't cover everything. So tonight I'm just gonna focus on the cask programs themselves, those that have operating cask programs that need you to kind of evaluate different things as you're investing in an entire an entire cask of, uh, of whiskey. And hello to, to James uh, Doherty joining us from Sleeve League as well. Um, we'll be giving you a hat tip throughout the evening. Um, and for those of you who are wondering, I will share this document, this presentation. I'll, I'll share it as a PDF after the uh, presentation is over. I'll make it a download. I'll post it to the Facebook group and I'll post it to the event pages uh, that you all signed up for. So you can download this yourselves afterwards. So this event will be available as a replay. You can go back and watch it a hundred times and you'll have the companion deck to go with it. So uh, it's yours to, to do what you want with it. Um, if you... Uh, if you have any questions, yeah, please put them in the in the comments. There are far more educated, uh, qualified, and talented people than me. I can see in the comments that can probably answer more specific questions that we won't get to. And James and Nick, if you want to talk about your programs in the comments, if you want to answer questions, please go ahead and do so. Um, anything we can do to support you and help you. Anybody else in the world of whiskey that has something to talk about with a cask program? Let us know, uh, share links, and let people uh, make up their own mind. And uh, yeah, let's have a let's have a, a bit of a chat. Um, okay, so here's what we're going to cover tonight: uh, the process. I'm going to go through the process of selecting, buying, owning, bottling, and shipping a cask worth of whiskey. Um, we're going to talk about the risks that can be associated. Anything we invest in, buy, any time we give have an outlay of cash. There's a risk associated with it. We want to talk realistically uh, and honestly about the risks associated. Uh, I'll briefly touch on whiskey as an investment, and uh, it'll be a very small part of tonight. 
Uh, then we'll talk, I'll share some interesting CASC programs from around the country that we can talk about, and I'll answer all of your questions. I have a lot of questions that you shared with me over the past few weeks. You posted online. I've gathered all those questions and answered them uh, either through the program or one by one when we get to the end. Um, okay. What's next? So, uh, important uh, disclaimer. What I'm sharing tonight is not going to be investment advice. I'm not here to advise you on what to invest, uh, where to invest, how to invest, uh, where you should put your money. Um, I don't take, uh, I don't think you should take what I'm sharing tonight as your only point of reference for investing or buying a cask of whiskey. I think you should look at this as one set of data points in the broader gathering of information that you'll do on your journey towards buying a cask if that's something that suits you. So don't look at tonight as investment advice. I will not be giving you investment advice. There may be errors, there may be omissions in this presentation. It's important to call that out uh, because uh, I am very fallible as I am constantly reminded uh, by my wife. And that means that there, there will be mistakes and we may have left something out uh, or we may have included something that's incorrect. So uh, if there's something that's incorrect, please correct me if you know better in the comments. Uh, I have thick skin, I can take it and we'll correct it. And uh, if there's something that I've left out, uh, feel free to put in the comments as well. But again, please don't take anything I'm sharing tonight as being the gospel, because Barry said it, we, we must do it. You're all very uh, big fans in the Facebook group of the hashtag Barry made me do it. Barry do, will not make you do a bad investment because of advice here. So it's entirely up to you. Don't, don't use the hashtag Barry made me do it uh, if you make a, a poor uh, investment uh, or a poor purchasing choice. So it's entirely up to you. Uh, I'm just here to, to help anyway, as best I can. All right, uh, what else? Uh, disclosure, I do own casks of whiskey. I've got three casks of whiskey. It's important that I tell you that uh, so that uh, you can see if I'm trying to lead you in any one direction or not. Uh, my goal is not to, but I have three casks of whiskey. They're all distilled and are stored in West Cork, in West Cork Distillers. I have one cask of single pot still and I have two casks of single malt. And I'm happy to talk about them. I'm happy to share with you what I paid for them, when I bought them, how I came about uh, owning them and... Um, yeah, I paid full price for them and happy to talk about them if anyone's got any questions. So that's just a disclosure uh, as well. Uh, let me see. Um, yeah, so in addition to that disclosure, like this is an independent overview. I'm not paid by anybody to mention them. I'm not, nobody has asked me to, uh, has, has promised me great spoils and returns and uh, a lifetime of riches in return for sharing their CASC program details tonight. So this is independent. It's an overview, it's designed to get us talking and to uh, whet your appetite and answer the questions you have, but uh, it is not paid for or sponsored in any way. So that's my, my bit of disclosure there. Uh, and um, as I, I have a lot to kind of get through, so what I'll do is if I see your questions coming in, if I don't get to them immediately, don't worry, I will get to them at the end and I won't forget you. I'll scroll all the way back to the start and get to your questions if I haven't, um, if I haven't answered them throughout, all right? Okay, so... With that, let me take a sip of whiskey and slauncha. Welcome, if you're just joining us, to our uh, overview of independent or, or independent overview of Irish whiskey cast programs. Let me wet the uh, wet the whistle here. All right. So let's start by asking the question: You know, what is a cask program? And we can look back to 2012 for our reference point as and, and to Dingle, to Dingle Distillery. And you see here uh, on the on the screen, the wall in the distillery, you walk inside the distillery, you'll see it up on the right hand side. These are the founding fathers. Uh, Dingle launched a very successful fundraising campaign in 2012 to help build the distillery. It was the first time a retail cask program had been ma made available uh, in, in Ireland in certainly in our generation and, and maybe if ever, uh, of course, casks were sold individually and were sold on to whiskey merchants and bonders back in the day. But this was the first time in our in our lifetime, really, that we saw something like this happening. 2012, there was only Middleton Distillery, Cooley Distillery, Kilbegan, uh, West Cork, and uh, what Bushmills were the only distilleries in Ireland. And then Dingle came along and said, we think we have a, a role to play in the, in the whiskey world as well. And so there, the cask program they created maybe set the standard for how many distilleries now lay out their cask programs and uh, people are learning, new distilleries are learning from what Dingle has done. And Dingle have been a great um, test case for how this works, what, when, whether it can work. They've recently had a second, uh, third successful uh, 
a fundraising campaign through uh, their descendants program for more cash for additional cash programs. But back in 2012, this was designed as a, you know, for, for I think it was 6,000 or 7,000 euros, maybe, maybe a little bit less. Somebody else will, will remember. Uh, I missed out on it. I couldn't get enough people together. Couldn't have afforded it myself. Uh, I remember sending the emails to, to dear Mary Ferreter, uh, uh, rest, rest, rest in peace, Mary, um, about the program and trying to get my friends together and nobody would commit $500 each to, to, to get this syndicate together. But in any case, they raised money to, to, to build a distillery. Uh, that's what a cask program for the most part does today is it's used as a kind of a liquidity event of sorts for a, for a distillery, for a new distillery. Uh, it's hard to get funding for distilleries Banks are, are, are loath to lend. Uh, it's a lot of private investment, friends and family, a lot of venture capital perhaps, or, or small venture capital angel investing taking place, uh, but a lot of friends and family money coming together to build distilleries. And of course, we all know it's a long process getting whiskey to market, isn't it? Many years of sleeping, many years of sleepless nights for the owners and sleeping for the whiskey uh, until, until it gets to the point where it can be bottled and sold. And so cash programs have been a way to provide some of the funding to keep the lights on while the whiskey matures. Some distilleries will, in addition, distill gin or vodka. Others won't. And so uh, cash programs can provide some uh, source of income. Uh, through those those tough early years. It's also a chance for you as a, as a whiskey fan then, of course, to get involved in that early stage uh, of, of a distillery. It's a chance to be part of the story. It's a chance to connect with the people of Irish whiskey. It's a chance to get closer to distillers. Maybe uh, you want to have a front row seat to the whiskey distilling. You would love to learn from a master distiller, a head distiller, and a cask program can bring you a little bit closer through certain points throughout that cask program for how you can, uh, yeah, you can you can learn a little bit more about, about the journey of whiskey while it sleeps all the way through to its bottling. So it's a chance to get involved. Uh, it's uh, a lot of cask investments, cask purchases are emotional decisions. They are uh, driven by a love for uh, a town, an area, uh, an industry, people. Uh, there's many reasons people get involved in, in, in a cask program. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about those. Uh, cask programs are a relatively new part of the Irish whiskey world. While the Irish whiskey world, depending on who you listen to, has been around since 1324, cask programs really can only date themselves back to 2012. Most cask programs are actually a lot later. So in fact, there are very few cask programs that have reached maturity in Ireland today where bottles have found their way to market. Dingle is an example of a cash program that has. There are mature Dingle stocks in the in the market today, either being enjoyed or have found their way into onto bar shelves or have found their way into retail stores to be sold. But what that means is that this is a very new endeavor for many distilleries. So there are many distilleries and many who have put these programs together who uh, have become very good at launching the programs, at setting up the programs, but many have not reached the level of maturity where at the end of the program, all of the variables have not yet been maybe um, worked through yet, or there, there are experiences that just haven't been had uh, when it comes to the maturing time of uh, the final maturation of the whiskey, what happens next. So we're, we've yet to see all of these new distilleries reach the point where their whiskey, their new cask programs reach maturity and, uh, and see what happens then. Will that whiskey find its way back into the market? Will it be enjoyed? Will it be, will it be drank? Will it be shipped to America? What will happen if we don't know? So it's a relatively new thing in the world of whiskey. So lots, I would say lots of unknowns, um, some unknowns, not lots of unknowns, some unknowns in any case. Um, Nick Ryan says, it's also a way of laying down stock. The whiskey may sleep, but the owners are working 24 seven. No doubt about that. So why consider a cask program? So lots of you had uh, asked if whiskey programs are a good investment, if whiskey programs are uh, something that you could get involved with with friends. Um, and I think it's important to start with your reasoning. Uh, everyone has a different reason behind getting involved uh, and why you might want to get involved. But I think whether it's for personal consumption in a few years time, once your whiskey is matured, whether it's to have presence that you can gift to friends and family or maybe to clients, uh, whether it's to bequeath this in your will to your children or your grandchildren, whether it's to mark the anniversary, uh, let's say your wedding anniversary or maybe the um, 18th birthday or 21st birthday of a child or a cousin or a grandchild or a godchild. Um, I think it's important to start with um, asking yourself why you want to do this. What's the reason? There's no right or wrong reason. It's more when we understand why we're doing it, we can then look at what we want that end to look like. So if 
we want to have whiskies available for our uh, son or daughter's 21st birthday in 15 years time, then we know what we're working towards. Uh, and let's say our son or our daughter and you are based in the United States. Well, then we know that we have to make decisions from now until then that will both mature the whiskey the way we want it, but will also allow us to have that whiskey in our hands in the United States by the time our children reach 21. So when we start at the end and work backwards, we can make decisions that help us get there because irrespective of why you're doing it, every decision you'll make from the type of wood you'll choose, the style of whiskey, the budget you'll, you'll assign to this, uh, the length of time you'll allow it to mature, all of these decisions, each decision will change, will get you closer or further away from that vision you have for your cask. So I think it's important to start with uh, what you wanted to end up with and work backwards. When I started, uh, when I considered getting into the cask uh, programs myself, I was looking around to, to see where could I get involved in the world of Irish whiskey a little bit deeper. And I wanted to follow the journey of a cask. I wanted to own a cask and I wanted to own it, not to do anything other than to follow its journey and eventually to drink it uh, in 10 years or 15 years, no small like three year turnaround, but something that could last, uh, there'd be a long journey and maybe some place that I could visit. Uh, so I had those kind of things in mind as I thought about West Cork Distillers and the cask program there. So there are early decisions that you, may make as part of your evaluation of a potential cask program. And there's four decisions that typically I have found come up the earliest when it comes to deciding A, whether a cask program is right for you, but then also if you've decided, yes, I'm getting involved, somehow the next steps I'll need to decide on a few things. Well, these four things come up over and over again as being the earliest decisions. The style of whiskey I want, the distillery perhaps that I want my whiskey to come from, maybe there's a location, uh, specifically in Ireland that uh, means something. Uh, and then of course the budget and each four early decisions, evaluators, uh, every time you'll make a decision, you will, uh, as you evaluate your, your, your ca potential cask uh, purchase, you'll narrow down your opportunities to get closer to maybe one style of whiskey uh, or one distillery or one region. And uh, there's lots of decisions you'll make along the way, but I think starting with these four is helpful. So let's work through each of these one by one. And again, all of these, all of these slides are going to be available to you at the end. I'll, I'll share them as a link. All right. So the first one uh, is the style of whiskey. So today there are, there are, well, the three main styles, the, the, the legal definition of, of the styles of whiskey are available in Ireland through uh, the, the various cask programs, single pot still, single malt, single grain. And there are, of course, peated options. James Darty will be nodding his head in agreement at the peated options right now and uh, giving me uh, many thumbs up. Uh, so what's worth bearing in mind is that these are single casks of a single style of whiskey. And the majority of Irish whiskey sold globally is blended whiskey. Your Jameson's, your Paddy's, Tullamore Dew, Bushmills Original, these are all blended whiskies where two or more styles of these three styles are blended together to give us the flavor profile that we know, that we love perhaps. If it's a Jameson, we're blending a single pot still and a single grain. If it's Bushmills, it's a single malt and a single grain. If it's Paddy, it's all three. And so that's something to bear in mind is that if you're considering investing in a cask program based on flavor, based on taste, it would be helpful if you had already some experience in a single malt or a single pot still, or you knew that was the style you liked. Um, even within those styles, a single pot still like a Redbreast, Redbreast 12 year old, you might be familiar with. I know we have many Redbreast fans. While that is one style of whiskey, we must also bear in mind it's not a single cask and it was not matured in one cask. It was instead a marrying, a vatting of many casks, ex bourbon casks, ex Oloroso sherry casks that were vatted together in uh, Billy Lighton's uh, magic uh, secret formula to give us the flavor we need. So we must consider, do we like these whiskeys before we consider investing in them, purchasing them? And uh, I think that's something that might, has taken some people by surprise is that the flavor or the taste, the style of whiskey may not be something that they're used to. So that's one thing uh, to bear in mind. Uh, but there are, uh, as you decide, like let's say you decide, okay, I want to have, I'm, I'm determined that my whiskey should be a single malt whiskey. Well, what that helps you do then is it helps you eliminate a bunch of distilleries that don't make single malt. So if I'm going to buy, if I'm determined to have a single malt uh, whiskey, well, I won't be going to Conakilty Distillery because they don't make single malt. Uh, if I want a single pot still, I won't be going to Dublin Liberties Distillery because they don't make a single pot still. 
if I want a non-peated whiskey, I won't be going to uh, the Ardera distillery with Sleeve Lee because they'll make me a peated whiskey. And so every time we make a decision, we'll hone our opportunities down to where we might end up purchasing from. Uh, so the style of whiskey is one of the choices you should bear in mind. Um, yeah, and again, single pot still, single malt and single grain, the smallest part of Irish whiskey by volume, but certainly those are what are being offered uh, by distilleries today. I didn't find any distilleries that publicly talked about offering to blend or offered to um, vat uh, different casks together. If you had different casks, I have no doubt it's a possibility and anything for a price is possible. There were conversations I had with distillers who said, well, we don't publish this, but sure, they can just talk to us. So that's another thing to bear in mind is that not everything is published and uh, everyone wants to have the, the, the secret handshake or the, the secret passcode to get something special. Maybe it's just a matter of asking if you want something else. All right. The next thing to consider is uh, the distillery. Is there a particular distillery maybe that you want to make a decision around? Here, of course, we have the old and new Middleton distillery uh, on the screen here. But maybe you like uh, the story of a new distillery. And bear in mind that the cask programs we're talking about today are mostly uh, about new make spirit, uh, mostly. There are cask programs that are uh, about purchasing a cask outright that has matured. Uh, and we'll touch on those as well. But for the most part, cask programs are released by new distilleries that will have you follow along the journey. So what you're buying is a cask of new make spirit that will mature over time to become the whiskey that you know and love. But maybe there is a distillery where you connect with the story. Maybe there's a distillery um, where you like the head distiller. You think he or she has a great vision for a, the style of whiskey that they're producing. You've liked what you've heard. You've maybe sampled some of their new make spirit. Maybe you have heard great things uh, about that particular distillery. Maybe a friend has purchased and has had a good experience. So maybe there is a distillery that drives your decision making. I shared 16 distilleries earlier on. You will find the map of all the distilleries on storiesandsips.com, all 39 of them. Um, but yeah, it's important to look into and do your due diligence on the distillery. Bear in mind also that there are distilleries that you may have fallen in love with today that have released a whiskey that uh, you would love to have a cask of that whiskey, but that may not be their whiskey. And uh, I have no problem and no issue with whiskeys that are sourced, third-party whiskeys that uh, are released under other companies' names. But just bear in mind that when it comes to their own spirit, it may be, and most likely will be, a very different whiskey. So a sourced whiskey might be a blended whiskey, it might be a blend of single malt and grain, but maybe that particular distillery only makes single pot still whiskey. So those are things to think about as well. Will the style that the distillery makes be similar to the style I want? Or is there a profile specifically that I'm looking for? Um, uh, Patrick asks if I've seen any finishing options. Yeah, there are finishing options for a price from a number of distilleries. Um, I'll talk about some of those when I get to the wood section. Uh, the next thing uh, maybe to bear in mind or consider is location. Uh, seeing as this is designed primarily based on questions from the US, uh, getting to Ireland certainly hasn't been easy the last year and a half, has it? And maybe there are areas in Ireland that are easy for you to get to or that where you have spent time, where you have uh, maybe your relations, your cousins, you have family, maybe your family came from a certain region, maybe you've fallen in love with a region, maybe you want to invest, buy, purchase, be part of that region and feel like you're an owner, you're a stakeholder in that particular region. I know uh, somebody in our Facebook group who, who purchased a cask of... Uh, whiskey from Dingle for no other reason than they loved the town of Dingle. And they weren't huge whiskey fans, but they wanted to get more involved and feel like they were supporting the town of Dingle. There's no wrong or right answer, but again, these are considerations uh, to think about. Where's the distillery located? If you're thinking about the journey you want as part of your cask program, if your journey involves you wanting to visit that distillery many times over the course of the three to eight years that the whiskey is maturing, is the distillery easy to get to? Does it fit in with your own plans? Sadly, Americans don't have enough vacation days, holiday days to be traveling as much as they'd like to. So if you've only got so many days available each year, can you get to the distillery? Uh, and there are certain north, Northwestern distilleries that might be harder to get to than those closer to the airports. And I'm not naming any names, people in my audience, but uh, something to bear in mind as well. Is the location important to you? And maybe you have fallen in love with a particular area and you want to be more involved in it. All right, let me take a sip. Thanks, Steve, for the reminder. Barry, have a sip.
Stacy says she would love to see the Burren Distillery, but I barely found the dolmen. <laughs> we'll 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 talk to the Burren Distillery soon. There's a huge white snake in that sea, says Alan. <laughs> Can't go wrong in Dingle. That that picture, by the way, of course, is uh, looking out towards the Blasket Islands, out, out on the Dingle Peninsula, looking southwest, out to the the Great Blasket Island. Alrighty. Uh, the next thing to bear in mind, of course, is your budget. Because no different than you going to the local liquor store and finding bottles of Irish whiskey for sometimes sub $20, uh, all the way up to you going to Celtic Whiskey Shop or Dublin Airport and finding a bottle of Middleton Very Rare Silent Distillery for $46,000. It's the same with casks. The range is massive and there's something for everyone. And uh, for example, this this uh, range of prices is is real. This is authentic. There are casks available for nine hundred and fifty dollars in Ireland, and there are casks available for, for four hundred thousand dollars and more. Uh, any guesses where the four hundred thousand dollar casks are coming from? And any guesses where the uh, whose hands whose hand that is pouring the whiskey into the glass? I wonder. but there's something there for everybody at every price point. Uh, so it's something to bear in mind. Also bear in mind that the cask program prices, the listed price for a cask is not the all in price. And we're gonna talk more about that as we get through it, but there are more prices, are more costs involved at various stages. I'm gonna list all the things to be aware of to factor in as you consider it, uh, whether you leave your cask in Ireland, whether you bottle it and, and leave it in Ireland or whether you bottle it and send it overseas. Um, but yes, this is Middleton, uh, Middleton Distillery. Um, that this, actually, that is um, Brian Nation's hand. Um, so we're seeing Brian Nation twice in a week, once on the lock-in and now here again in his old job uh, as master distiller uh, at Middleton back in the day. So yes, you can. Uh, Middleton has, has an interesting cask program that uh, is not about new make spirit, but we'll talk more about that as we go through as well. So budget, keep that in mind. Uh, there is a, a formula uh, that I'll share with you uh, when we get to the cost side of things that'll help you work out the all-in cost, whether you keep it in Ireland or you ship it to the United States as well. All right, so let's say you've decided on one of these things. You've decided on a location, you've decided on a cast type, you are sorry, you've decided on a distillery, you maybe have decided on a spirit, uh, a whiskey style that you like. Uh, the next thing that you will be faced with is deciding, in some cases, uh, which cask type to use. And uh, this can be confusing, can be uh, can seem uh, daunting to many people. Uh, but of course, the spirit that you buy, when you buy it, which it'll eventually become whiskey, but it'll only become whiskey after it ages for a minimum of three years in a wooden cask, such as oak. The, uh, there are distilleries that will only offer one type of uh, wooden cask to age a whiskey in. There are distilleries that will offer you 12 plus options on what to choose and what to put your spirit in. So uh, choosing the cask type is the next thing we wanna look at and we want to evaluate. So um, here's an example of a distillery that offers at the very minimum 12 different cask types. This is Boan Distillery, uh, Boan Distillery in, in, in County Meath. And here they have 12 individual cask types available. The cask type you select will have a number of knock-on effects, won't it? It'll affect, obviously, the, the uh, ultimate uh, end flavor of your whiskey. Uh, I don't believe for a second that all the flavor comes from uh, a wooden barrel. Uh, some people will tell you that it does. I think it is a, I believe it to be a factor of all of these aspects of whiskey production from uh, growing of the barley through fermenting, distilling, and maturation. But the wood plays a, a significant role, of course, in the mellowing and the, 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 the layering of complexities of that spirit the different wood type you use, uh, the different contents that were in that cask before will affect ultimately the whiskey that ends up in your bottle. It'll also, of course, uh, the cask you choose will determine the price you'll pay. Some casks are more affordable than other casks. Um, we, we know that bourbon casks, for a distillery that's purchasing a lot of bourbon casks, they might be able to get a used bourbon cask themselves for $80 to $120 ballpark figure for ex, uh, ex bourbon American oak cask. If they're looking for um, an ex Japanese uh, whiskey stored or a Mizunara oak cask from Japan, you might pay five, six, seven thousand dollars for a cask. 
and also, of course, depending on the size, the wood type, European oak, American oak, they'll all affect the cost uh, of the cask that goes into it. Uh, Alan wants to know, can you request the cask to be charred or toasted? For the most part, that's already decided. The um, distilleries are buying in the casks already charred or already toasted. Um, nobody that I, no distillery that I looked at offered it uh, publicly. But again, I'd imagine that if you wanted special orders, you could uh, request things based on whether it's price or a minimum order quantity. For example, Boan Distillery, in addition to the 12 that they offer here, will also source you acacia, mulberry, uh, chestnut casks if you want them for maybe a minimum order of six casks. So the options are out there. Boan Distillery has a very extensive micro website on their website all about their cask program and the different options that are available. But choosing which cask type is going to work best with your spirit, if those options are available to you, is probably a conversation you want to have with the distillery. It's probably a conversation you want to have with the distiller and um, maybe getting uh, some samples or having uh, them recommend something that you could try that could be similar to the flavor profile that they're aiming for, or at least that they can explain to you what they anticipate happening with this type of spirit in this type of wood over this period of time. Okay, so let me see. Um, yeah, so, um, and, and, and there does seem to be some consistency across, well, I wouldn't say across the board, but there does seem to be a kind of a, a, sweet, a sweet spot and, and you can argue with me all day long as to whether it's sweet or not, but there's a price point of around five, five and a half thousand euros, six thousand euros that a lot of distilleries are choosing for their cask programs. I don't think it's based on anything specific. I think it's something that, you know, one person prices a cask. You got to look at the competition. You got to see, are you competitive? Are you not? Uh, these are things to kind of bear in mind uh, as you look at the cast programs too. But like I said, they, depending on the type of wood you choose, the spirit you'll put into it, cast programs will vary dramatically in price. Uh, and back to the budget point as well, um, a point I missed there is that some distilleries will ask for 100% of the money up front. Others will allow you to split the cost over a few years in a kind of a payment plan. So that's something to bear in mind as well. Uh, additionally, I know some people are curious about, well, can a group get involved in purchasing? And uh, if that's something you're interested in, typically what distilleries are looking for is that there's one point of contact with a group, or in some cases, they're actually limiting the size of the group to four people or six people so that it's a manageable size. What they're probably trying to avoid, as I can imagine, is if you've got a large group of people who are putting their pennies together to purchase a cask and everyone in the group is reaching out to the distillery with questions, with uh, requests to visit, it can become quite onerous on the distillery. And we want to be sure that our purchase is not is supporting the distillery and not in any way preventing them from making great whiskey and, and marketing themselves and, and helping us, uh, helping uh, put them on the map and, and help them build their business as well. All righty. Um, yeah, so finishing is an option from some distilleries. Uh, and it, it, again, I would look at, I would, if finishing is something you're looking to have done, I would ask the distillery because most of them don't list finishing as an option. Uh, Celtic Whiskey Shop does. They list it as an additional option uh, on their on their website when they buy from Great Northern Distillery. But um, again, it's not something that's listed very commonly. Um, okay, so uh, Scott, I will get to that question in a second. Let me look through my notes here. 30 pages of notes. Okay, so the wood that you choose, of course, will influence your cask. James Doherty is jumping up and down, seeing his beloved cliffs up there in, uh, up, in the, the, up in Donegal. What are they, the second, second highest sea cliffs in Europe? Is that what they are? Um, so look, once you've chosen your distillery, once you've chosen your spirit, once you've chosen your wood, your budget, next comes handing over the cash, you know, and uh, getting the title to your, to your whiskey. Most of the distilleries will issue you a certificate of ownership, uh, confirming, and you know, which is the title for, the, uh, for that cask. You now own that cask. Some of them will bake in insurance into the cask purchase. That insurance will cover the length of maturation, sometimes a few years beyond maturation if it's still in their warehouses, uh, beyond the, 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 the prescribed maturation period, should I say. Um, 
so yeah, once you hand it over, hand over your cash, your first payment, the title transfers to you in most cases. In some rare cases, the distillery may hold the whiskey in a trust, uh, which then gets handed over to you and reassigned to you as an individual or an LLC or whatever it is you purchase it as, as a syndicate, once the maturation period uh, is, is up. These are things just to, to ask questions yourself of the individual distilleries. How do they work it? What's their system? Um, so then comes the long sleep. So the reason new distilleries are opting for cash programs is because they want to keep the lights on during this long sleep. And this long sleep, of course, is the most time consuming part of the production of whiskey. Fermentation and distilling can happen in a matter of days, but of course, whiskey takes years to uh, become, the spirit takes years to become whiskey. So your spirit will go into your cask and it'll sleep for a minimum of three years. Now, what I found from looking at all of the distillery programs in Ireland is that there are certain distilleries will mandate a minimum maturation time. When that happens, what the distillery is telling us is that they have an understanding as to what they believe will work best and give you the best spirit over um, the best spirit based on uh, the best whiskey based on the spirit the style of the style of uh, whiskey that has gone into that 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 cask, the cask type, the conditions, anticipated loss every year. So it ranges from three years all the way up to eight years. Some distilleries will not let you take your whiskey out before eight years. Others will allow you to take it out after three years. Uh, others will allow you to take it out at periods at intervals after three years up to a certain point. So uh, the long sleep is really where your journey after purchase, after you've done all your investigating, after you've done all your evaluating, the next thing that happens is that you've got this period of time. It could be three years. I'm intending to leave my cask there for 10 years. I haven't told West Cork that yet, but um, I don't, don't think they'll have any problem with it because I'll be paying warehousing fees. I'll talk some of those about some of those fees in a second as well. Um, but the long sleep, of course, is where cask programs can come into their own. So that's where you have the opportunity to get more involved, perhaps, with your spirit as it matures, with the distillery, with the region, with the area, with Ireland. And every distillery has a different offering, a different way of doing it. Some distilleries don't really have a huge interest in seeing you very often. They'll happily ship you a sample. Maybe they're not built for uh, tourism. Maybe they're not built for in-person visits. Other distilleries will welcome you with open arms and through their, their doors uh, as often as you want to visit. Uh, and so every distillery will have a slightly different version of what can happen during this long, long sleep. Um, so what's happening over this period of time um, inside the, the warehouse? Well, of course, your spirit now is, is maturing. It's mellowing. There's a process happening of, there's an additive process, a reductive process, a uh, um, happening between the wood and the spirit there's a mellowing that's taking place uh, flavor compounds are being formed what's also happening is you're losing some of your 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 investment you're losing some of your whiskey and it's an unavoidable and completely necessary part of whiskey production where the angels themselves are coming down from heaven with their buckets and their spades their their, their ladles and they're filling filling up their buckets with a portion of your cask that you put your children's inheritance into they're coming down from heaven and taking a little bit a little bit of it back up so there is a stock loss, there is an inventory loss, a cask loss, a whiskey loss every single year. There is a perhaps a larger loss in the first year once the cask is filled. So uh, distilleries will share varying numbers. Typically between 2 and 4% of your cask will be lost in the first year. And thereafter, anywhere from 2 to 2.5% 2 a year seems to be the average with maybe another 1% allowed for, 1.5% allowed for during the bottling stage and the disgorgement stage of the cask. So if you have a cask that is maturing for 10 years, you should expect to lose 25% of it uh, over the course of the 10 years. That means uh, you've lost some of the water, you've lost some of the alcohol in that cask, and you're left with three quarters of the barrel really at the end of, the, at the end of your 10 years. So those are things to factor in to the purchase as well. So if a 200 liter bourbon cask is purchased uh, and you're expecting to bottle all 200 liters at the end of your maturation, you might be disappointed to know that you won't get all 200 liters back. 200 liters goes in and maybe 160 comes out or 150 comes out depending on, on the maturation as well. Also, uh, you know, it's going to depend when it comes to the bottling stage, which we'll talk about a little bit later, how many bottles you'll get based on at what ABV you end up bottling your cask at. 
Uh, and also the sampling, uh, as Mark says there, um, there could, um, There'll be some loss in the sampling, depending on how many times you visit. If you're there every second day, uh, being the scourge of the distillery, looking for another drop, another thimble from your cask, uh, there might be nothing left by the end of the 10 years if you if you keep knocking on the doors. A lot of the distilleries will look for a bit of advance notice. You know, If you're coming, tell us, we'll be ready for you. We'll have your cask ready. We'll pull a sample for you. Uh, so uh, yeah, they'll want, to, they'll want to know a little bit in advance if they can. Uh, let me see. Okay, so with that length of maturation, this long sleep, uh, what else you should factor in here is that if you're timing your whiskey cask purchase with uh, an anniversary or with a special event, you've got to think about does it align. Uh, Dingle in their most recent program uh, required you to leave your cask for eight years. So if you have something coming up in five years that you want your cask for, and you want labels done and bottles made and everyone's going to get a bottle of your whiskey in five years, well, the Dingle Descendants program would not have been for you. Another program, maybe a three-year program, might be more, or a four-year program, or five years, like Sleeve League, uh, might be something that's uh, more suitable to you. So that's something to, to bear in mind as well. Alan asks, is there an option in how and where the cask is stored, different price levels for quality management? No, there's, I, I've not seen that level of, of, of micro, mic, literally micromanagement of, of the casks in the distillery. Uh, and bear in mind that, look, the cask programs are, uh, most likely a small, small part, ideally, of the distillery business. They're hoping that this will help fund the distillery, but at the same time, it's not their business. You know, the business isn't isn't just to sell single casks. It's to sell bottles. It's to it's to get bottles out into shelves and bars and restaurants. And so, the cask management, the cask programs, I'd imagine, have only a certain percentage that they can occupy in terms of the time, the resources of the distillery themselves. So that's I don't think you're seeing. We'll be seeing that very often. Um, but again, money talks. If you're looking for something special, I would talk to the distilleries directly. Okay, so let's talk about what can happen uh, as well as or some of the options then during the, the long sleep. So um, in addition to your whiskey maturing and mellowing, many uh, distillery programs, cask programs are offering chances to interact with the team, chances to visit, uh, occasional annual perhaps, or uh, once every few years, events uh, that'll happen at the distillery, get-togethers, samplings. Some distilleries will allow, will allow uh, you to come and visit and take a sample. Others will ship you a sample once per year or uh, a sleeve league, if I remember correctly, on the third and fifth anniversary of your uh, cask purchase, they'll ship you samples. Their program is called the um, Shanaki program, which means storyteller. And so they'll give you a sample every yeah, on the third and fifth anniversary of your uh, of their mandatory five-year maturation. But at the same time, you're also free to visit the distillery and maybe uh, get a sample as well uh, if you're if you're very nice to them. They'll, they'll open up your cask for you as well. The um, Here is a picture from the Crawley Distillery. So the Crawley Distillery, uh, like many other cask programs, they're interested in membership, that you're part of a community, you're part of a program, you're part of a a small select group of people. Uh, they also do something unique where they allow your friends to come and visit on your behalf. So maybe you're located in, Ar in the United States, but you've got friends in Ireland. I can tell you you'll have many more friends in Ireland if you tell them they can, they can visit the distillery on your behalf and sample your cask. But that's something that they're interested in. They want you to come visit and they want your friends to come with you or in some cases without you as well. So they can come and give the cask uh, a taste or give it a kiss on your behalf or give it a rub for you. Uh, to make sure that it's still there. There's also perks with various programs, depending on the distillery that you might decide to purchase from. Hinge Distillery in County Down, just outside Belfast. Some of the perks they'll offer, for example, while your cask is maturing, they'll give you a bottle of 18-year-old single malt whiskey, a bottle of the wine from their own vineyards in France, little little perk uh, that you can have. They'll also give you a bottle of your new make spirit, so that you always have a separate little bottle of your little baby uh, as it started out uh, before it became whiskey, what that new make spirit was. So again, as you think about what the journey should look like for you, you, you can consider all of these various programs in terms of what they offer. Are you looking for perks? Are you looking for visits? Are you just interested in getting a sample once a year? Uh, and consider, does the distillery you're exploring offer you the journey towards maturation that you yourselves might want to be part of as well? Dingle, when they launched their Founding Fathers program in 2012, put a huge emphasis on community, on 
building relations. And I remember the newspaper articles at the time. I was living in Ohio, 2012. I remember seeing the articles in the newspapers talking about building connections with the uh, with the Irish diaspora around the world through this Founding Fathers program and how this program would give Founding Fathers a chance to come back to Ireland once a year and meet their fellow Founding Fathers of the distillery and have a, a nice evening, get to visit their cask, tour the warehouse, do some fun events around community. And so many of the distilleries we looked at have built community into their program. So rather than just selling you the cask, and this is something I like a lot, is I don't have an interest in just having the cask. I want to be part of something and I want to know I can visit, you know, I can, I can meet others who are interested as well. Dingle does that really, really well. Other distilleries do that well. There's a, another distillery not yet opened, Killarney, um, Clarny Brewing and Distilling Company, they're going to be factoring in uh, community and events as part of their offering as well. So uh, if that's something that you're interested in, ma making, building relationships, I know a lot of you are great relationship builders and want to meet Irish people and fellow whiskey fans from around the world. Those are things to bear in mind as well. Others then will offer luxury experience, high-end luxury experiences, high-end experiences. Middleton with their cask circle, which is something they don't advertise. In fact, many people are surprised to know that there's a cask program in Middleton. It's not so much as a, of a program so much as I can buy mature stock from Middleton. Now, they only have 30 casks right now available to purchase. And those will set you back anywhere from forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 up to four hundred, five hundred, maybe six hundred thousand dollars maybe $600,000. But they're also building in luxury experiences around those. You can have, uh, you, you can meet your fellow cask circle members for dinner in the distiller's cottage, have dinner with Kevin O'Gorman. You used to have dinner with Brian Nation. Maybe you'll stay at the nearby um, Castle Martyr Resort, go clay pigeon shooting. Uh, maybe you'll stay in Bally Malou House in Shanagari and have a dining weekend around your cask program. Maybe you'll arrive by helicopter. Maybe you'll fly, maybe you'll land by private jet in Dublin Airport and take the helicopter down to Middleton. So there are various options depending on what it is you're looking for. And there are people at every price point uh, who, who will perhaps gravitate towards the one that matters most to them or the one that yeah, fits their vision for what the cask should maybe look like at the end, but also what's the journey look like along the way. Um, so a few things to, to, get, uh, to consider there. Mark wants to get a free villa with a cask for 600,000. You'd be lucky. <laughs> Um, this is, um, this is, uh, these are old casks, empty casks from the, uh, Middleton, uh, warehouses. Uh, these are old Middleton, very rare casks and they're not, there's nothing in them. These are just for show. Steve curious about those ones. Okay. So let me see. Okay. So, um, what else have we got? Yeah, so I talked about losing. You're going to lose some of your whiskey through evaporation, through the angels, share. Uh, there are various perks. Again, we can't, time doesn't allow us to go into every single op offering from every one of the 16 different distilleries. That's, that's, that's your due diligence to figure out. But what I want to highlight is what, how are these structured and what should you consider? And then also what are they all in costs? So now we've gone from, we've chosen our cask. We've chosen our wood. We've let it sleep. It's matured. It's now finally matured. Now it comes time to bottle it. It's, uh, it's the time to drink it. It's the time to get it uh, to its final destination. Uh, a little sneaky self-plug there of our own bottling of the story that took place at JJ Curry uh, as well. Steve wanted to see the previous slide on their side. That's Dingle. That is Dingle. Yeah, some on their side and some upright. And these are all empty then from Middleton. I'll let you all uh, battle out the pros and cons between distillers and, and distillery owners there in the comments about the pros and cons of sleeping on its side or standing up. Do, 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 do. Jordan says he feels bad requesting a pin to look at their program. Yeah, so if you Google Middleton Cask Circle, you will be directed to a page that asks you to put in a four-digit pin and you can request a pin. So... Uh, I look forward to hearing your feedback on what you uh, get introduced to there, Jordan. I was talking to them to, to the team in, in Middleton during the week about the cask circle, and they said they have they have 30, 30 casks available, uh, single pot still uh, that have been aged in rum, Madeira, Marsala, uh, ex bourbon, Virgin American oak, aging in range from 
eight years up to 30 plus years incredible whiskies obviously some of the most sought after whiskies on the on the island are available there but again it's not really a cask program in the way we're looking at these other cask programs it's mature stock it's not new make spirit you're not following a journey along you're saying no i just want my own middleton very rare labeled for me i'll talk a little bit more about that program as well so it's time to bottle it so let's look at some of the things that we have to consider because this, this is now where some additional costs start to add up and add up very quickly so once it's time to bottle it and most distilleries will have already established the parameters around these things when you've signed before you signed your documents your purchase documents so you're not you shouldn't be very surprised uh, you shouldn't be um it shouldn't be it shouldn't come as a surprise to you but it's always a surprise when there are new charges and new bills that you have to pay so what happens first after it has finished its maturation well let's say there's a mandatory five-year maturation you may work with the distiller to evaluate that whiskey at its fifth uh, anniversary together you may come to the decision that it's ready to bottle you may both sample it and decide yes it's ready or you may take the decision to age it for longer if you age it for longer the distillery will offer you most likely the chance to uh, mature it there in their warehouse, or they may send it to a third party bonded warehouse like Stafford warehouses uh, where you can uh, pay an annual fee. It might be 95 euros or hundred dollars approximately a year to house your, your, your whiskey cask under bond uh, free from you having to pay any taxes on it yet. But let's follow the scenario of you wanting to now bottle it because it's five years, it's ready, you've tasted it, you love it, it's time to get it into your belly. What has to happen next? Well, the first step is disgorging, uh, emptying the cask, filtering the cask uh, of its sediment uh, and uh, storing it in uh, an IBC, storing it in a container ready for it to be bottled uh, when it's uh, the time to bottle it, uh, when it's ready in rotation perhaps to be bottled. Then there are some questions that you have to ask yourself. Some of these questions may have been answered at the start of your investment because certain distilleries don't allow this to change, but others do. For example, what alcohol by volume will you bottle your whiskey at? Most will have two options, cask strength, that is straight out of the barrel, out of the cask, uh, at the strength it came out of, they will allow you to bottle it. Or in the case of Dingle, we'll take as an example, most Dingle whiskies are released at 46.5%. That's their house bottling uh, ABV, really. That'll be the alternative. So those are typically the ABVs that you could bottle it at. Other distilleries will allow you to perhaps be more flexible, and others will just say, no, we will be bottling you a 40% single malt in a bourbon cask after three years, and here, here's how much it, cas it costs. So if you want lots of flexibility, you're going to have to, have to ask lots of questions and make sure that you've got uh, sufficient answers and you're comfortable and happy with the answers that they've given you about those. Um, Kieran wants to know, is it possible to have an age in multiple barrels? Yeah, um, so it is, but it's not a standard offering from most distillery programs that we looked at. But uh, Celtic Whiskey Shop, again, it'll come back to them as an independent offering. They source their whiskies, or you're buying into a program through them with Great Northern Distillery. They'll allow you to recast the whiskey. They'll charge you an extra 350 or I think it's $500, uh, 500 euros for that recasking and aging for a certain period of time. So it depends what you're looking for. I'd have those conversations early. I don't think it's out of the realms of possibility for most if they have the casks and they have the interest in doing it. Uh, so it's just a matter of asking the question, but it is it is possible. Uh, labeling then is another, um, and I, I, going back to the ABV, you'll see the dollar symbol next to it. All of these items here with the dollar symbol all have costs associated. Um, the bottling, well, you're going to need a bottle, aren't you? You're going to, you're going to be putting it into a into a glass bottle uh, you're going to have to be paying for corks you're going to be paying for labels those are all costs uh, associated in addition the labeling costs uh, can come down to maybe there's label design for some distilleries they don't want you to change the design of the distillery label whatsoever you might get uh, one area on the label where you can add your name you can add your syndicate name or you can add whatever name you want other distilleries say well it's your asset you can do what you want with it and uh, you're free to put any label you want in that and call it what you want it depends on the distillery. So it's another question to ask up front, what's your program offering in terms of flexibility with label design? Am I completely stuck to what you have there? Why, why certain distilleries would want you to have their label on it is that they're putting out into the world a whiskey that comes from their distillery and they may want the halo effect of people tasting it and saying, oh yes, that's an amazing whiskey. 
Where did that come from? Oh, I see. It came from Dingle. It came from Clannock Kilty. Um, I like it. Uh, pay for corks or not corks, asks Chris. Uh, it is a good question. Uh, I would imagine it's per distillery as to what they offer you. I don't think Dingle's going to offer you a screw cap. And uh, for the most part, I think it's corks that um, are being used and, on the distillery programs. But again, the bottling hasn't happened in most distilleries yet. We're still at the stage of maturation for these early cask programs. So bottling is still a few years out for these. So I don't know. Uh, maybe it's not even been decided by some of these distilleries yet. Uh, so labeling is to be considered. Packaging and materials. So what's going to happen after you... Um, oh, there's, I doubled up on my copy there from the first one. Uh, but packaging materials. So is it going to be put in a box? Is it going to be put in a case? Is it going to be put in a in a, in a glass bulletproof uh, container? What are you going to store your whiskey in? What would you like it shipped in? You're going to pay for those materials as well. There'll be a standard cost and then there'll be extra costs if you want to bring your own. Maybe you're a woodworker and you, you're a great turner of wood and you can make a lovely case. Maybe you're able to bring your own case and they'll put the whiskey in there for you. Moving the whiskey. This is where a lot of the costs will add up very quickly. And I'll dive into that more deeply in the next slide or two as well. Um, and then you have to decide whether you're going to keep it in storage or whether you're going to move it. And so moving the whiskey and keeping it in storage will incur varying costs based on what you decide to do. And we'll walk through some of those scenarios now in a second. But if you keep it in storage, again, the distillery can offer to do that. Most will, will happily do it. In fact, some offer storage past their mandated maturation period. So if the mandate is five years, they might offer storage for up to eight years included in the cost. All right. Next up. So let's talk about some of the scenarios and let's look at one of these. So the first scenario is you decide. So let's say you're in America, as many of you are, uh, and you want to, you've bottled your whiskey, but you're not ready to take it over to the United States. You have no way to get it there. You haven't figured out the shipping. You want to leave it in Ireland, but you want to take it out of the distillery. Once the whiskey leaves the bonded warehouse and the distillery, tax becomes due on it. So distilleries have a bond either on site, they themselves have a bond, or they are, uh, they are a bonded tenant of a bonded warehouse. And a bond is basically a license from the government to store a spirit and alcohol without paying the tax due on it until it leaves the warehouse. So if the whiskey stayed there for 30 years, the tax wouldn't be due on it until it left at the end of 30 years. If you took the whiskey out after, after four years, the tax becomes due immediately. So after five years, your mandated maturation is over. If you decide you want to bottle your whiskey and you have a good friend in Ireland who's got a lovely big house and they've offered you a room to store that whiskey in, that's very kind of them, but you're now on the hook immediately for the taxes that are due on it. So let me take a sip here. I'm talking so much, I'm going to pass out. It is water I should be having to. Yes, the taxes are absolutely insane. Patrick, they are. Do, 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 do. Steve wants to know, who keeps putting up the angry emojis? Why are you mad? I don't see any, I don't see any here. People get very angry at things. Um, the two taxes due are excise duty and value added tax. So Ireland happens to have uh, one of the highest rates of excise duty in Europe. Uh, four times as high as Italy, as an example. So the tax due to the government, and when you hear the Irish complaining justifiably about the cost of whiskey and spirits in Ireland, this is the reason why they're complaining. Uh, uh, it's because the tax is so high. 42 euros per litre of pure alcohol is, uh, is due. And value-added tax, wait for this, 23% of your original purchase price, plus all the bottling costs, the dry goods costs, the insurance costs, plus the excise duty is then taxed at 23%. So Ireland's, Ireland taxes the tax. Remarkable. And uh, I don't know how they get away with it. So they're taxing the tax. There's lots of double taxation, stealth taxation in Ireland. Uh, when you buy a car, you buy a house, when you buy whiskey, all these hidden taxes, and the tax is often taxed separately. So this is where it starts to get expensive or can get expensive. But then again, you've bought your whiskey. You might have bought your whiskey in a, in a very affordable cask. So even when you add these in, it may not reach the, uh, the costs, um, too stratospheric a cost. But we'll walk through those scenarios in a second. 
Nick Ryan says, uh, cheaper to buy a bottle of whiskey in Italy versus Ireland. I'm in San Diego right now. I can walk out of my door. I can go to the local uh, liquor store and I can buy almost any bottle of Irish whiskey, surprisingly, except Redbreast 21. That seems to be the, across the country, the odd one out. Every other Irish whiskey I can buy for cheaper than I can at the distillery in Ireland or at a shop in Ireland or a grocery store in Ireland. Uh, so yeah, it's down to excise duty and value added tax. So let's walk through uh, that scenario a little bit. Um, so here's a sample scenario. That's so I'll work through this with you and we'll, we'll do it slowly and we'll figure this out. So let's say your original cask costs $5,000. And for the sake of our, of our uh, workings here, we're going to assume this includes all the dry goods costs, the bottling costs, the insurance costs, the storage costs, the labels, etc. So let's just work with this, 5,000 euros. At the end of your maturation period, let's say, for again, the sake of our scenario, you're left with 200 bottles. Let's say they're 750 milliliter bottles. Um, well, we'll say they're 700 milliliter bottles in the case of this, uh, which you bottle at 40% ABV. Now you're, you have 200 bottles came out of a 5,000 euro cask, great. That means your per bottle liquid costs would be 25 euros, right? 25 euros X tax, 25 euros per bottle before you've paid any of your taxes. The duty at that $47, 47 euros 52 cents per pure liter of pure alcohol would work out at 11 euros 92 per bottle, which you add on to your 25 euros, which would give you 36 euros 92 cents. You then have to get 23% of your 36 euros and 92 cents because that's your value added tax VAT at 23% and that would be 8 euros 49. That gives you a total bottle cost of 45 euros a bottle or 9,000 euros for the entire bottled cask. So you started with your 5,000 euro cost price cask. You now have it in your hands in Ireland in your friend's house in their room as long as they picked it up and drove it there and you didn't have to incur additional transport costs of um, 9,000 euros and 82 cents. Richard says, I'm not really selling this thing. I didn't set the rules and I didn't make the taxation, but wouldn't it be ridiculous of me to go out and tell you to go and buy a 5,000 euro cask and not tell you that you're on the hook for another 4,000 later on? These are the costs and it's not, that's why it's important that we know them all going into it. This is not a cheap, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, consideration. But again, we chose a 5,000 euro cask here you can get a cask for 900 euros. So my three casks that I have in West Cork Distillers, I bought them all for under 1,000 euros. In fact, the single pot still, I think, was 800, 800 euros. And my single malts were, I think, 850 or 900 euros a cask each. I didn't go for the Middleton cask circle because uh, then I would uh, have no pension, no, no home, nothing. Uh, but instead, I went for an affordable cask. So those are some of the costs. Now, it's not the end of the world. There's ways around this. There are ways around this. Um, Jordan says mind boggling taxes. Yeah. So don't complain to the distillery about the cost of their whiskey. Don't complain to the brand about the cost of their three year old spirit. They have to pay these taxes. So whenever you're buying a whiskey from, let's say you pick up a 50 euro or a $50 three year old whiskey and you're wondering how does a three year old whiskey cost 50 euros? Well, 24 euros of that probably went to the government. So now there's 26 euros left. So uh, it's the government we should be marching to government buildings in Dublin, uh, complaining about these costs. Okay, so um, you can avoid the taxes, um, not evade the taxes. You can avoid the taxes uh, if you ship your whiskey overseas. Potentially, again, this is not, I'm not giving you investment advice. I'm not a tax advisor. Uh, I have no knowledge of the tax code or laws wherever you live. But if you ship your whiskey out of Ireland, your, uh, the distillery, so long as they are registered for value added tax and excise duty, uh, can apply for the exemption so that you are not on the hook for the duty or the value added tax. But you will be liable for the federal taxes and the state taxes wherever you're located in the United States if you're shipping to the US. It may well work out to still be cheaper to get your cask full or your cask worth of bottles to you in san diego or san francisco on the west coast of america than would then it would be if you live next door to the dingle distillery and you carried your bottles by hand or in a wheelbarrow from the distillery to your house um so 
you can avoid the Irish taxes, but it doesn't mean you can avoid taxes. So let's talk about what that looks like. Getting your whiskey to the United States. Bald Eagle, uh, only a fellow, a fellow American citizen as myself could put up a slide like this. You can strap your whiskey to the back of a Bald Eagle and get it to the United States. Let's talk about uh, what it'll take to get it to the United States. And Chris wants to know, are there issues? Absolutely, there are issues. Uh, with every single state, there's an individual set of issues about getting the whiskey into the United States. And uh, that goes all the way back to prohibition era rules. Uh, so there is a three-tier system in the United States. And it's uh, many of you are familiar with this three-tier system. It is a system designed to prevent uh, monopolies and prevent, it was a uh, post-prohibition era uh, legislation that it was designed to prevent monopolization, prevent one company controlling all aspects of production, distribution, retailing, and uh, controlling costs, etc. That means that, um, let me see, let's take it to the next slide. So what do you need to expect? So with the three-tier system, here's what you'll need. You'll need an importer. Now, the distiller themselves, the distillery themselves can operate, uh, or they may have their own licensed importer in the United States. Um, depending on the labels that you have for your bottle, um, the importer uh, will need to apply uh, for a label approval from the uh, the uh, TTB in the United States, which is what? The T Trade Tobacco, Alcohol, Tobacco, Trade Bureau. Um, they will need to apply for federal approval for your labels. It's not a complicated thing, but there are certain parameters and rules. Most distilleries who ship to the United States are already aware of the rules, have submitted labels in the past, but it's something to bear in mind that uh, it's not guaranteed. In order for their, your whiskey to be approved for shipping into the United States, it needs an approved label from the US government. Um, you'll then need a distributor. So when you talk about the three-tier system, the importer and the distributor uh, typically uh, are separate. There's a couple of different versions of the three-tier system, but bear with me on this one. You'll need a distributor, uh, and that distributor can then either sell that to a retailer or sell it directly to you, depending on the state that you're in. Every state has their own set of rules. The taxes then that you avoided paying in Ireland will then be due at both a federal level and a state level. Every state will have a different set of uh, state taxes. And bear in mind that if you're shipping your whiskies from Ireland to the United States, and you need all of these different people involved, they all need to be paid along the way as well. So when I reached out uh, to a few of the distilleries asking about the costs of getting everything to the United States, most distilleries have not got this in place because it's really complex. Even Middleton doesn't have this completely worked out for the cask circle. Six-figure casks, it's still ridiculously difficult to get a cask to an individual. Now, you're not shipping the wood. You can't ship the wood. The wood itself stays in Ireland. You're shipping bottles, right? But, but you're shipping your cask's worth of whiskey. Um, it's very, very difficult to get it to an individual. So it needs to go through the three-tier system, and that can be a challenge. So Middleton has figured it out with a couple of states, but they haven't got it figured out with all states yet. Um, I know uh, Steve League, uh, James, um, has got a portion of this figured out, I think, for a number of states in the United States and can figure this out uh, for you. Dingle has figured this out through their distributor and can get the uh, cask to you potentially in your state. But again, your state is going to dictate certain things about what can and can be brought can and can't be brought in. So, what should what would the costs look like then to you on average? So, even though you've avoided paying the Irish taxes and the Irish duty, when I had a couple of distilleries run the numbers for me in Ireland, what it ended up uh, turning out to be getting the cask to a sample state like California from the United from Ireland. Again, it can vary state by state. Turned out to be almost within 100 euros of what it would have cost to pay all the taxes in Ireland and keep it in Ireland in the first place. All that work we did, and we don't really save any money, potentially. You might save some money, depends on your state, and it depends on whether the distillery has relationships in place or will do this for you. Not all of them, in fact, very few of them, have considered this or have been asked about it especially seeing as it's two, three years down the line for, for most of these distilleries, at least. All right, let me take a break and take a, a sip of something while I look at your comments. All right. Yeah, every state has its own um, 
its own individual its own individual rules and yeah there are so for example uh, Larry who uh, Larry Masuka who worked with us on getting the story into the United States he's working with Dingle and he's helping them get some founding fathers casks into the United States and he's looking at that as a test market or a kind of a proof of concept to see if he can help others but it doesn't mean that one man can help get everybody's cask into America uh, but there are I know that more distilleries are going to have to figure this out and I would urge any distillery who's joining us from Ireland who's listening now to try and get that as figured out as possible as early as possible. All right, so we'll come back to, I'll take more of your questions on this as well. Um, taxes and Trade Bureau, that's it. Alcohol and Tobacco Taxes and Trade Bureau. Thank you, Amy, for that. Uh, Ohio has huge issues. Yeah, Ohio is a control state and uh, the, federal, the, the state controls what is allowed in and out. Uh, single casks are notoriously difficult even to sell within the state. So getting a personal cask in, I don't know. All right, let's move along here. So what are the risks then associated with a cask purchase? Um, there are risks. Look, this is an investment at $900 and $900,000. It's there, there, there are risks uh, involved in a cask purchase and there's no harm in us understanding them. Uh, I will uh, add the caveat that I am very bullish and excited about cask programs in Ireland. I think they have their place, and I think that it's a fantastic way to build community and to fund a distillery at the same time and to tell a story, both from the distillery side and for people to feel part of something. So I believe in them when they're done right and when people get into them for the right reasons with all of the right information. However, there are risks that are involved with everything, and we should be aware of some of those risks. So let's take a look at them. So. In no particular order. The distillery could go out of business. If it does, well, I think you're out of luck. Uh, any insurance you have is typically for fire and theft. I don't know if there's insurance that the distillery will offer you for if it goes out of business or if any other insurance company would insure your investment separately in case it did go out of business. I don't know the answer to that. Smarter people than me might, uh, but that's a risk. It hasn't happened in the last few years yet in Ireland, uh, but we don't know. Uh, we hope that it doesn't happen. Uh, the distiller might leave. What if you buy into a distillery because of the distiller and you like their skill and you like the way you like their, their approach to blending and to, and, and to cask management and to distillation and maturation? They could leave. There's already in the last couple of years, we see movement of distillers around the country. We'll see more of that. There will be more demand for distillers. Uh, and if the distiller leaves, does that, uh, will that upset you? Will that be a, is that a risk associated? Only, only you can decide. Uh, the whiskey may not taste like you had hoped it would. So there are many programs out there right now where a distillery has not even turned out turned on their still yet, and they are offering cask programs. They are, uh, in some cases, run by uh, a, a distiller, apprentice distillers or those who are new to the world of distilling. Maybe the spirit that they make does not meet your expectations for what it was. So that's something you have to be prepared for. There's a lot of unknowns. And uh, many of these distilleries are, are new and they will have teething problems and uh, maybe they're not able to produce the style, the, the, the quality of spirit that you're hoping to, to get access to. Uh, tax rates and alcohol laws could change. That's something that we know could change very quickly depending on administrations in the United States, depending on government changes in Ireland, in Europe. Uh, so those things could affect your investment. Uh, fire or damage could cause you to lose your cask. Now, while insurance may cover the loss of your cask, it won't give you the cask back. So you may get the money back, but you won't have your cask. So that's something that could happen. We, we touch wood, hope it doesn't. Uh, you may not have the money to pay the taxes or the shipping uh, on the whiskey when it comes time to mature it. So we now know that whether you ship it to the United States or you leave it in Ireland, the formula approximately you should be playing with is about 90% additional to your original cask cost should be the formula you factor in at what your final costs are. So will you have that same amount again? So if you've invested 5,000 in the cask to begin with, will you have 4,000 available at the maturation stage? If not, that's a risk, isn't it? Uh, and it could get destroyed during transit. Uh, heaven forbid, but if the ship sank or the, the, the plane crashed or any number of things uh, happened, if it fell off the back of a truck, your shipment could get destroyed and could get lost. Uh, sometimes there's little insurance for those things, uh, but those are things to consider as well. So some risks. 
Again, I'm bullish, I'm excited, I'm in favor of cask programs, but uh, we should go in with our eyes open rather than our eyes closed. All right. So let me see. Um, let's talk really quickly then about some interesting programs. So just a few examples of the different styles of programs that are out there. Boan Distillery have a very advanced cask program out there. Every type of wood you can imagine. They're using nanotechnology, nanoparticles to coat the inside of their copper stills. They are doing interesting things with technology. If you are technology driven, if you are a nerd around that approach, this could be an interesting program for you. In any case, they're doing really interesting things and their program just won uh, best uh, new make spirit at, uh, was it the San Francisco Whiskey Awards, Spirit Awards, one of the programs in any case. Lovely looking distillery too, Boan Distillery in Drogheda, County Meath. Uh, Tony says, if you pay all the taxes in Ireland, don't you still have to pay all the US taxes as well? Uh, yeah, I don't, but I don't know why you would pay both in the sense of if you know you're going to bring it to the US, um, why pay it in Ireland? Um, you'd probably want to figure out how to get it out of bond in Ireland and ship it to bond in the United States so that the, um, the taxes don't become due in Ireland. So you'd want to avoid taking it to your friend's house, paying all the taxes in Ireland, and then deciding a week later, oh, I'll ship it to America now and then paying all those taxes all over again. You're right. All those taxes and shipping charges would be would be additional. So that would be that would be something you don't want. Uh, so okay, so Bowen Distillery are doing interesting things. Clonakilty Distillery. So um, growing uh, some of their own grain. Here is their barley fields on Galley Head, a few miles from the distillery. Nine generations of family of the Scully family have been farming their land there. Uh, it's something where they'll proudly, Michael Scully will, will proudly take you out to the, 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 the fields, let you stand in there and get some of that barley in your hands as the Atlantic waves crash over the, uh, the fingers of the, uh, of the galley head there at the lighthouse. So you may, get you may want to get involved with a local story, a family story, where they're growing some of their own barley uh, and, and they're going to distill it in their, in their pot stills just a few miles from town. West Cork Distillers. So uh, I'm an investor in three casks in West Cork. What's unique about West Cork is that they've developed a cooperative investment or purchasing program. So they opened up uh, a program to, I think, about 200 purchasers where you could buy into a cooperative, which, uh, and in this cooperative, what, what they've uniquely done is there's a cooperative and there's a marketplace. So they're building out a marketplace, an online marketplace, where you can trade your casks amongst members. So you can actually offer your cask to other members if you want to sell them, uh, or you can offer them back to the distillery. The distillery will buy your cask. I've already been approached by the distillery asking if I'd like to sell them back the casks. I, I already bought them because they have a need for them. Uh, I said, no, get away from my whiskey. Um, I'm keeping it. Uh, but in any case, they have an interesting approach. I think it's closed currently, but you can get on the waiting list for these cooperatives and this, this cooperative program. And it's a very uh, affordable way to get into the world of Irish whiskey cast programs because with a cooperative you're splitting the kind of the overall cost of the program around a bigger a bigger group of people uh, and I found it to be a, a really interesting one. Uh, Frank said he sold his cask back to the Dingle Distillery because of the additional cask the additional costs associated. So that is a, an important thing to to think about. Some distilleries fewer now than in the past will offer to buy your cask back. Some won't publicly offer to do it, but they will do it behind the scenes. But if it is something they will do behind the scenes, I'd get it in writing that it's an option. Uh, if they will buy their cask back, the ba if, that's an if that's an option, it's a nice risk-free way to get in on the journey. So you might get your cask investment back plus 5% or 5% a year or something like that. Uh, and some distilleries offer that cask that, that purchase program, Clonakilty offers it. I know Dingle did offer it with the Founding Fathers program. I don't believe they're offering it currently with their most recent program. And, and there are one or two other distilleries that are offering it. Uh, it's also a good show of support or belief from the distillery in their own product, but it's not without its own challenges on the balance sheet as well. So uh, something, to, something to bear in mind. Middleton Distillery, obviously this is not a cask program like a traditional cask program. It's a, you're buying, mature stock, right? So, but if you want to get involved, if you want to own your very own cask of 30 year old matured pot still whiskey, there's only one place in the world you're going to go and get that. And that's Middleton Distillery. No other distillery on earth can give you a 30 year old pot still whiskey. And it comes with its costs, but it comes with its benefits. And um, there are syndicates that buy in there, but they only have 
30 casks uh, right now they make available. And every year they reevaluate to see which casks will make it into the cask circle that will be available. And as it was explained to me, if uh, a certain visitor to the distillery during the tour expresses an interest uh, or shares how maybe they are um, they're already an investor or they purchase their own cask of Speyside or Isla whiskey themselves, Scotch, um, or they're a bourbon investor, a bourbon cask purchaser, that's an opportunity for the tour guide to say, interesting, we may have something that's of interest to you. So they don't publicly shill it. They don't talk about it a whole lot. It's there. It's often behind the scenes. And it's kind of a thing that if they see an opportunity and it's of interest and it's a fit, they'll introduce somebody to it. And they might say, you know what? Come with me. We've got something special. And they'll get the special bunch of keys and bring you to the, the warehouse number eight, the stone warehouse, and they'll show them the casks. Uh, so that's something special to bear in mind. Uh, Powers Court Distillery, uh, which releases their whiskies under the Furcullen, Furcullen brand, which we don't see a lot of in the United States yet, but I think we will in the future. What's interesting about Powers Court is that you have a master distiller, Noel Sweeney, who is a Hall of Fame uh, icon of whiskey uh, distiller, who himself has distilled probably 70% of the whiskies that are non-Middleton and non-Bushmills that are on the market right now, because he was the master distiller at Cooley Distillery until uh, un until very recently. And uh, he was involved in all the Kilbegan distilling, Cooley distillery, uh, the Cooley distilling, and now he's he is the master distiller at Powers Court. So there you have the opportunity to get involved with a, a very, very experienced award-winning distiller. Not only that, Powers Court distillery actually have old stocks of whiskey, like Middleton does, that Noel himself distilled at Cooley that could be 20 years old or more, that you can purchase from Powers Court. So you could actually purchase whiskey he made at Powers Court, whiskey he made at, for, at, at, uh, at Cooley, all in the one place. So that's something interesting uh, and worth calling out as well. Thoman Gate whiskey. Uh, we have uh, Nick Ryan joining us on, on, in the audience tonight. Nick is, uh, doesn't have his, his own distillery yet. I wouldn't bet against him having it, and hopefully he does. But uh, Nick uh, offers an interesting program where you're going to get involved with a journey and a mission to bring distilling back to his beloved Limerick. And so if you're a Limerick native or a descended from Limerick, uh, this could be something that is of interest to you. And Nick has got a lot of personalized, individualized, and really special touches like this book of custodians and, and a really interesting program that follows along with that. So uh, Nick, uh, kudos to your program and hopefully you'll be successful in that as well. And uh, Nick is, a, is not just a whiskey uh, company owner. He's a whiskey educator and a spirit educator and uh, and knows what he's doing and knows what he's talking about. So uh, something I'd recommend checking out as well. So let's look then finally, or as we get close to the end, is whiskey as an investment. So you're, you, you will see lots of middlemen, middle merchants, uh, sales companies, or there's really no way to, other way to describe them, just middlemen who will sell, who will offer to sell you casks of whiskey as an investment. And they um, may wave about figures of Irish whiskey's astronomical growth. They may wave about the rise in value in casks of Middleton whiskey or bottles of whiskey that have been released from well-established distilleries as proof of what a cask could be worth. Um, there are uh, these middle merchants of course, don't own distilleries, but rather they sell on behalf of a distillery. So they're buying from a distillery. They're then going to mark it up, of course, and sell it on to you. Uh, you may decide that's something that's of interest to you. I'm not here to advise against it or for it. Rather, I would add caveat emptor, buyer beware. When there are any wild claims made about return on investment in whiskey, I would be very, very cautious and slow and and uh, be keeping my hands on my checkbook before uh, parting with any money. Uh, whiskey as an investment is interesting. Uh, it's being touted as an alternative investment. Um, if the stock market cannot be depended on and gold is not holding up and cryptocurrency is too volatile, well, maybe whiskey is an alt investment, an alternative investment. Um, things you should bear in mind, uh, I would suggest as you consider this, and I will add again, I'm not an investment advisor. I'm not here to give you advice. Please don't take this as being a uh, solid advice. Do your own due diligence. But if you're purchasing a cask of whiskey with the hope of making a return on it, be it 5% or 500% or whatever claim somebody has promised you, 
bear in mind not only the risks I shared earlier, but also that if you're looking to resell your cask, um, first of all, you as an individual probably don't hold an alcohol license, so you cannot sell your whiskey yourself. You'll have to work with the distillery to figure out how you can, uh, how they can find a buyer for you perhaps, uh, work that way. Also, there needs to be a market for that whiskey to be purchased. So we have 39 distilleries. We have 16 different programs on the market right now, which means at a minimum in the next three years, if not earlier, the market is going to be flooded with new whiskies that have come from cask programs that are now finding their way into people's hands who are hoping to either resell them or maybe they'll drink them. But there, I'm sure there are investors in programs right now that are hoping that as soon as it's matured, they can flip their whiskey for a profit. And there are no guarantees that that's that there's going to be a market available, that you're legally able to do it, or that anybody will have any interest in your whiskey. So I, uh, the best bit of advice I ever uh, got uh, when it came to investing was before you get in, already have a clear plan on how you'll get out. I don't believe there's a clear plan for how to get out in the world of whiskey uh, in terms of investment, and there's no guaranteed return when it comes to whiskey. So those are things to bear in mind. Now, saying that, there are options and there are ways to have your whiskey sold or to have your whiskey um, perhaps put on the market. Celtic Whiskey Shop, as an example, will, uh, if it comes time to, uh, if it comes, uh, maturation comes to the point where, okay, it's ready, uh, but you now want to sell it, they will look for a buyer for you. And they will, they will put it out there to see if there's somebody available. If there's not, you're out of luck. Uh, Irish Malts, John O'Donovan, John, John O'Donovan was on here earlier. Maybe he is uh, still on here. Uh, in any case, John O'Donovan, co-founder of Irish Malts, irishmalts.com, great friends of Irish Whiskey, great friends of us at Stories and Sips. John um, and his team may purchase your cask if they believe it's of interest to their audience. If they believe there's a market for it, they may purchase the cask and sell it through Irish Malts. So you've seen over the past year, uh, some Dingle founding fathers bottles have found their way to Irish Malts. So where John has seen the opportunity and it works for all parties, that is something that they will explore. I was messaging John earlier and he said, yeah, by all means, mention us. We'll look at anything. But again, like anything, there are no guarantees. As Declan says here, uh, caveat emptor has never been more apt with Irish whiskey. Yeah, I would, again, I can't emphasize this enough. Beware of men, beware of fast talking men in uh, shiny suits with all the answers and no downsides. Be very, very wary. Uh, this is not a guaranteed return. I love cask programs for their journey, for their story, for their support of the Irish whiskey industry, where everybody wins. I love them for bringing people together. I love them for forming groups and syndicates where we can enjoy a journey together. I love the idea of sharing my whiskey with friends and family. I love the idea of going to check on it. Um, I would have personally have no interest in buying up casks of whiskey to flip them or to try and flip them. It To me, it seems at odds with my journey in the world of Irish whiskey. But again, you get to do whatever you want. But again, buyer beware. All right. So I've shared a lot of information. I can't have covered everything in the world of whiskey, but let's look at some of the questions that you have to make sure that I've answered your questions. And let me move this out of the way a little bit. I want to get to all your questions here. Has this been helpful so far? Uh, have, have we got, have I given you some information that has been helpful in your decision making or in considering? Uh, I know we've gone on quite a bit here, but um, tell me if this has been helpful as I look through your, your questions. Okay. Uh, Shane has some good information. He says there's a limit to the amount of samples per year before duty has to be paid on it. Good information there. Um, do, 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 do. Jeff would like to join a group to buy a cask because he doesn't have the 5,000 himself. So um, let's quickly talk about group buying. If you were to buy a house with a group of friends, you would go to your attorney and you would drop the contracts and the paperwork to lock in what that would look like, wouldn't you? You'd be making a big purchase, a big investment. You'd probably spend a lot of time as friends uh, hashing out what goes into it and what you expect to get out of it and what you want along the way and how you would make decisions as a group as part of a purchase. 
my recommendation with a, a group purchase with whiskey is that it's no different. That you as friends uh, sit down and evaluate if it's something that you want to get involved in. I don't, no matter how much we love whiskey, I don't think it's worth losing friends over. And nothing can send friendships south faster than bad business deals. And the uh, assumption or incorrect assumption that uh, somebody is trying to get one over the other one. And that's an awful situation for friends to be in. So if you're getting into a syndicate or a group, you want to come together, it should be uh, very clear. A few things should be very clearly understood and agreed upon by all members. One is, uh, why are you doing this? What's the goal? What's the journey going to look like? How do you make decisions along the way? And what happens, for example, if the additional costs that become due later on at the maturation stage, what if one or two of your group members can't afford to pay their share? I'm part of a couple of uh, whiskey groups um, where we, we've purchased old whiskies, not necessarily casks. And we've been very careful about documenting all of these things and making decisions. And we went to the trouble of having it all legally put in place. So we had to sign contracts documenting and stating our decision-making process and what would happen in the event. So we even documented in the event that somebody needed to get out of the investment group or somebody needs to get out of our, 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 our little syndicate, how would they be bought out and who would have the first chance of buying them out? <clears throat> Maybe they, they, for health reasons, they needed money or for whatever it might be. How would you get out of that group? So those, those are things to consider when it comes to groups. Um, let me see. Questions, questions, questions. Yeah, you're all talking about the taxes. Richard says, uh, what's this? A weekday means no turtleneck. I thought the neck should get a bit of veneering today. You know, maybe a bit of sun. It's got very white. It needs a bit of tan. Uh, Stacy wants to know, does the distillery have to already have legal rights to ship to the respective state? Um, no, so the distillery doesn't, but the importer uh, would need to be able to work with a distributor in the state. So uh, again, the three-tier system, it might be importer, distributor, retailer, or it might be importer slash distributor um, retailer, and then you, it depends, states are, are starting to open up with different uh, opportunities, but the distillery doesn't have to have the dealings with the state directly. It typically comes at the, that's typically something the wholesaler, the distributor uh, will do themselves or the importer. As an American purchasing in Ireland, Scott wants to know, can we use the scheme where we can get all of a por or a portion of our taxes returned? There are schemes in Ireland uh, called, I think it's EE, -E, is it EIIS or EEIS schemes where uh, a portion of your investments are tax refundable. In Ireland, I, as a non qualified tax attorney, cannot talk about that. So I have no idea uh, what the implications would be for you as a US resident. Um, that's something you should, uh, you probably have to pose to the distillery themselves. Do, 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 do. Well, lots of comments in here. This is great. Do, 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 do. Patrick Miller from Talnua uses a broker that imports to a bonded warehouse in Kentucky. We then ship direct to our bonded warehouse. A bit of paperwork, but he's not a private citizen in that regard. He has a license to rectify spirits, store, and distill. Yeah, so Patrick has worked out that on his side. Lots of you talking about wondering how Irish distilleries make any money when they sell bottles at $30 or $20. Yep. Dave wants to know what I think about the historical mash bill cask program that Boan had. Yeah, really interesting. If you're a historical fan and you want to taste whiskeys in the style or the mash bills that they were produced in historically, you've got a historian and a distiller working together to produce a style of whiskey that is not common to us today. That's very interesting, isn't it? Uh, that's something that we should encourage and celebrate. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Um, yes, you're liking this information. Good, 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 good. Scott says he would think the majority of the people in this group would purchase for themselves and friends and family, though several bottles of the story did make it to Irish whiskey auctions. Yep, yeah, it happens. Um, you know, uh, I think it was explained in, a, in a, another Facebook group recently that we often don't know as well, you know, when if there's a private release for a Facebook community and it's supposed to stay within the community, if that bottle ends up at auction, we never know that person's individual circumstances. 
they may need a hundred dollars like we don't know and uh, ship, uh, sending their bottle for auction might be a way of getting a hundred dollars that would mean the difference between they eat today or they don't eat today and uh, I, I wouldn't judge them on it so um i wouldn't be concerned at all um and i'm a believer in in free market conscious capitalism and that anyone can do what they want with their bottles but yeah it says you mentioned being able to invest in a portion of a cask I don't know about investing in a portion of a cask. I know that there are portions of casks that you can buy bottles from. Uh, Boan Distillery will, will allow you to have a bottle every year over 10 years from, from different stages of the cask. Black's Distillery in Cork will allow you to buy an eighth of a cask, maybe, I think. That's worth checking out. Um, WD O'Connell will allow you to buy, they're calling it a share of a cask. It's really a bottle. You're buying a bottle per cask. Um, the share is the bottle. Um, so there are some of those programs out there. Uh, a lot of those are very, you can imagine the amount of time and, and effort taken to manage individual programs where a 200 liter cask is divided into 200 people. Uh, and then there's 200 casks. Now you've got, what's that? 40,000 people. Do, 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 do. Lots of you saying whiskey is about friends and coming together. Yep. I'd agree with that. Uh, Declan says, if one was to consider investing, has Irish already peaked? I mean, it, it, it's a, how long is a piece of string, Declan, really? You know, it's there's a market for the right things at all times. And if you don't have the right thing at the right time, then it's not your market, is it? Um, and there's ebbs and flows, and there are collectors of certain brands, and there's collectors of certain styles. Um, we don't know what the market looks like for whiskey as a cask investment Um because the market hasn't yet matured enough or the, the programs haven't matured enough to the point where the market has been flooded with casks. So we don't know yet. Um, but five years ago, was anybody interested in pursuing uh, $900 bottles of red breast? Nope. Today, people are lining up to be chosen to buy a 600 or 520 euro bottle of dream cask and, uh, and not sleeping at night uh, waiting to buy it in five years time. Maybe it's powers they're pursuing. So there's ebbs and flows and peaks and troughs with anything. Few of you have bought uh, bottles or casks of bourbon lately as well. Great. Uh, Patrick says, also remember, uh, risk that uh, state shipping rules can change constantly, and they do, and they do. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, so there we go. That is our, um, that's been our little overview of Irish whiskey cask programs. Um, you know, we didn't cover everything because there's 16 different programs. Everything is as their own opportunity, their own offering. Here's my recommendation to you. Go out and talk to the distilleries, uh, go and talk to uh, representatives, brand representatives of the distilleries, ask questions, things that aren't on the website. If there's things you discover tonight during the program that have piqued your interest, maybe you want to go and explore those. Uh, maybe you want to put those to distilleries that don't have those things mentioned on their website. There are Facebook communities like our Facebook community, Irish Whiskey Fans of America. There are Irish-based uh, Facebook communities and groups that have people who have invested in casks that can offer you feedback. Uh, I would ask lots of questions before I, I let go of my checkbook or my credit card, uh, but I would be uh, uh, bullish and uh, excited by the Irish whiskey market and where it's going. And I think there's going to be some tremendously good whiskies. And we're going to look back on this in a few years' time and remark at what amazing deals there were in some areas and uh, how terrible some of the investments were in others. But that's like anything. Uh, I think that could apply to anything we could possibly put our money into at any time of the day or night. So um, lots of different options and opportunities out there. Um, let me look at, uh, there was a few more questions that you posed to me during the week that I want to make sure I answer before we go as well. Do, do, do. Mark wants to know, what am I going to do with my 600 bottles from the three casks I have? Well, in 10 years' time, I might have 600 friends. I have only six friends today, and hopefully I'll have seven friends tomorrow, and then eight friends the next day, and then I'll, I'll give everyone a bottle of whiskey in, uh, in 10 years' time. Uh, some other questions that you asked me that I didn't answer. One here that uh, we should clear up, somebody asks, is it uh, when, when buying a cask, is it more feasible to bottle in Ireland and have the labels approved by the TTB then, then ship to the US, or is it more cost-effective to ship the entire barrel to the US and then fill them 
as needed yourself. So I think we touched on that, but you can't ship a barrel of whiskey to the United States. Um, no distillery will probably do that for you. You uh, Irish whiskey ceases to be Irish whiskey once it leaves uh, the barrel um, or once the barrel leaves Ireland. Um, so um, all the distilleries will do the bottling for you. So that all has to be bottled in Ireland to the best of my knowledge. I've not heard of any opportunities to ship your liquid in non-glass bottles like, um, um, no, like IBCs, the big plastic, uh, those intermediate bulk containers, as that's how most whiskey is shipped internationally or over long periods. I know you can bottle Irish whiskey anywhere in the world, but I have not seen that as an offering from any distillery. Is there a deal to be had on a cask of new make and then wait three to 10 years to enjoy it? Or is it better to buy a barrel that was laid down some time ago that's already available? It's a great question because most of our talk tonight has been about new make spirit that becomes whiskey. The challenge with trying to buy whiskey that's already mature is that it's really expensive because there's so much demand now for whiskey. So as the demand for whiskey has grown around the world, what's happening? Large supermarket chains are coming to Ireland and looking at distilleries that produce third party spirits. West Cork Distillers, great northern distillery. And they're saying, hey, can we get um, 800,000 litres from you over the next two years or 80,000 litres or whatever it might be? And they're, they might not even have enough to be able to fulfill those contracts. And so they're not making available, for the most part, age stock. The exceptions are places like Powers Court Distillery, Middleton. Uh, I don't think Bushmills has, a, has an aged cask program where you can buy mature stock from Bushmills. But, so you're really looking at really two distilleries to buy mature stock to the best of my knowledge. Maybe Great Northern has some that's mature that they'll sell you, but it'll be a little bit more expensive. How do you tell a good cask investment from a bad cask investment? Um, that's a great question. It, there's no 100% way really, is there? Uh, I'd be looking at all the factors, like I talk to people, I would want to know who's involved in the distillery, who's behind it, who's distilling, what's their track record, what have they done before? Uh, what's the likelihood of them succeeding? Um, are you a fan of what they're doing already? I'd weigh it all up. There's a lot of factors there to, to start listing out for yourself and use this presentation tonight to, to list all those things out. Will the distillery buy back your cask? Some will, some won't. Ask them. And if they do say they, if they say they will, but it's not part of your prospectus or your 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 contract, have it written in. Who monitors who monitors the whiskey while it's maturing? Um, the distillery should and does monitor it. And as part of their, I'd imagine their their um, kind of monitoring of their of their mature maturing stock themselves. Are you charged VAT per annum? No, uh, you're charged VAT at the time of the uh, leaving of the bond. So at the end of five years, three years, 10 years, whenever you take it out of the bonded warehouse, bottle it, and it leaves the distillery or leaves the bond, that's when you pay your VAT uh, on the total of the purchase price plus the duty. Do, 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 do. If I find a fault within the product with my samples, what's the protocol and am I insured? I would immediately book a flight to Ireland and bring my pitchfork to the distillery and demand to see the distiller. I think a, a simple phone call or an email and say, hey, wondering what's going on here. I don't, I, I don't like the taste or I think there's something wrong. Can you help me out? And I'm sure that the distillery will make it right. Do, 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 do. Yeah, I think we've answered all the other questions to the best of my knowledge. Um, so I think that's it. Uh, if this has been helpful, um, would you tweet about it? Uh, would you share this in any Facebook groups or communities? Would you share a link to this um, out on Twitter? Uh, tell people about it, email it to your friends, anyone who we might be able to help avoid making uh, a disastrous uh, purchase that they don't know anything about, give them all the information. That would be really helpful. Uh, as always, the, look, I, there's no cost to attend these things. All I ask is that you tell people about them and hopefully we'll get more people interested in Irish whiskey. And uh, if you are talking to any distilleries and you're talking to any whiskey brands, mention stories and sips and tell them that we're flying the flag for Irish whiskey and we'll do our best to support them as well and to bring it to their attention. Do, 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 do. Uh, Dahi says, Mrs. Chandler, my mother in Cove will get a shock when three casks arrive in the post and not the odd bottle. She will. She will. She'll have to build an extension. 
we have to get a bond. <laughs> Declan says, thank you for your whiskey insights. Do, 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 do. Thanks, Declan. Much appreciated. And uh, if there's anything you want to see more of, if there's anything I can do a deep dive of at any time, uh, I'm not an expert, but I'll do the I'll do the uh, I'll do the deep dive to find out and answer the questions. I'll learn along the way myself, and I'll share what I can with you. So um so yeah so just uh, do me a favor and just share this wherever you can. Uh, I'll post a link to the 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 slides now in our group as soon as I go off the air. I'll share the link, and uh, I'd love feel free to send it to whomever you like. Uh, send it far and wide. I don't need any email addresses or anything. Just send it away and get people uh, get people involved and let's get the conversation going and let's get some more distilleries supported uh, in the right way and let's be part of the journey. And uh, I know we're all going to be involved in things together over the coming years through maybe some bottlings we'll do together here in Stories and Sips, and uh, maybe we'll get involved in casks together, who knows? But I'm sure there's lots of great fun things ahead. So I'm very appreciative of uh, of your company during this journey, and uh, and thank you for for um, sticking in with me. Um, do, 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 do. <laughs> Steve says, what's that place I found in Middleton? Can we all buy it and fill it with casks and bottles? Yeah, we should all, I mean, if we're very smart now, the 8,000 of us that are in our Facebook community should get what, $20, $20 a head. We'd have $160,000. We go to Ireland and we'll buy a house and we'll empty the rooms of any furniture that's in there and we'll just put in shelving and we'll have a shelf for Steve and a shelf for Dave and a shelf for Dana and a shelf for Declan and Dahi and myself and uh, we'll pay for round-the-clock security, somebody standing outside, maybe a, a German shepherd and uh, a security guard and we'll... Uh, <laughs> We'll, uh, we'll go and visit it once a year. We'll go in, we'll go in one day and, and fall out the door six weeks later. All righty. Sinead, uh, I'm off for dinner uh, per everyone's request who says, take Mrs. Stories and Sips for dinner. I certainly will. They've, they've all got your back. <laughs> all right. Uh, if you're interested in, in small group purchases, again, buyer beware. Do your own due diligence. Um, Feel free to talk amongst yourselves in the group about it, private message each other, but uh, get uh, get contracts in place and cover yourselves. All right. Slaunch, everybody. Thanks for joining. We'll see you soon. All the best.